It's time to tune in to Defending the Faith with Frank Harbor. Hear the latest about religious liberty. A win for religious freedom in one of the remaining blockbuster cases facing the U.S. Supreme Court this term. A legal battle continues for the Little Sisters of the Poor for nearly a decade now. A street preacher armed with a speaker, a microphone, and a camera strapped to his chest is now banned from the village. Our founding fathers believed in the separation of church and state, but not for one fleeting moment. Did they believe in the separation of God and government? And powerful apologetics. Are you prepared to defend the faith? I'm convinced unless we trust in God, this nation is finished. We're facing a new kind of enemy. We're involved in a new kind of warfare. And we need the help of the Spirit of God. Three, two, one. Welcome to Defending the Faith. I am Frank Harbor. I am your host. I am the president and the chief legal counsel of the Institute for Christian Defense, and we defend the faith. If you have never been to our website, defendingthefaith.law, there you can find out about us. We do religious liberty cases. We have several cases right now uh, that involve pastors, churches, Christian businessmen. We also are involved in theology and apologetics. So I've written several books. I, I was an atheist for 21 years and set out to prove that Christianity was not the truth. And I've written a, a new book called Prove It, Examining the Evidence for the Existence of God. I've also written uh, a new book called Objection Overruled, which is how to answer the top 10 objections to Christianity. And this is a free ebook that you can get on our website, and it'll tell you how to defend the faith. Today is a very special episode. We have a very special guest, uh, a friend from way, way, way back, uh, is, is going to be on the show today. Today we're going to talk about the Ukraine, and this is a special episode of Defending the Faith and is somewhat time-sensitive. In fact, I'm hoping in a short amount of time that this crisis will have passed and that this episode will uh, be moot, but as it stands right now, uh, Russia has invaded the Ukraine, and the situation is very dire, um, particularly for people who are on the ground there. There's a lot of uh, innocent people there. And just imagine for a moment if if someone invaded right here in the United States of America, what would you do? How would you react to that? Um, so – Today, our special guest is Amy Pinnell, and Amy is a missions coordinator for Michael Gott International. She also happens to be the daughter of Michael and Jan Gott. Uh, in fact, her name used to be Amy Gott, but now it's Amy Pinnell, and she is married to Jimmy Pinnell, who happens to be one of my favorite people in the whole world, uh, an amazing person who's been at many, many churches. He was at Ridgely Baptist Church in Fort Worth. He was the pastor, the senior pastor of Hewland Street Baptist Church, and uh, and he's an amazing uh, Christian businessman. He's successful um, beyond your wildest dreams, uh, and God has really, really blessed uh, he and Amy. And Amy's parents, Michael and Jan, uh, She'll tell us in a moment probably how many times they've been to the Ukraine and how many times she has been to the Ukraine, but thousands and thousands and thousands of people have been reached with the gospel because of the work of the Gott family. This is a, a legendary family. It's an epic family. Amy is joining us today. She was just in New York City on Fox News and we can talk about that in just a moment because they, uh, it has an interesting story because they sent a van uh, to to do the interview because if you don't work for Fox, you can't get in the Fox studios. We'll talk about all that in just a second. Amy Pinnell, how are you doing? Hi, Frank. Thanks so much for having me on today. Absolutely. Amy, let's start out. Just tell us a little bit about your family and your connection to the Ukraine, let's set this up so people can understand who you are and why you know what you're talking about. Well, um, 
So our connection started with Ukraine back in 1967 when my father was a graduate student at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And during that time, um, the Soviet Union offered propaganda tours to Western graduate students. And he took advantage of that opportunity and traveled to the Soviet Union in 1967. During that time, he was able to visit uh, what became the nation of Ukraine and visited Kiev and then also the city of Lviv and was able to kind of break away from the tour group and make contacts there with pastors, local pastors. And he returned to Ukraine on his own later, was kicked out by the KGB and blacklisted for bringing in Bibles and other what they considered to be religious propaganda. Uh, all the while, though, his heart was just drawn to the nation of Ukraine and wanting to return. So the first visit was in 1967, and um, then he was kicked out in the early 70s, and uh, it took until the Soviet Union fell in 1991, as we all know. Uh, he started trying to get back into Ukraine, and it took until 1997 for MGI, Michael Gott International, to become active in the nation of Ukraine. Since that time, we have done hundreds of um, English language evangelism events in the nation, as well as concert tours with the Singing Men of Texas and the Texas Country Boys, the Arkansas Master Singers, and other groups. And we have had over 100,000 people register uh, positive decisions for Christ since 1997 in Ukraine. Wow. So that's, that's incredible. Uh, and of course your dad is just, he's, he's a legend, uh, and has preached the gospel all over, not just in the Ukraine, but he's, he's a fabulous, uh, communicator. So we have a situation right now where Russia has invaded the Ukraine. Amy, you would know because you're in contact with Ukrainian people, churches, pastors, Christians, is this a surprise? Tell us, tell us what's, what, what people are thinking there in the Ukraine. Well, Frank, I think that for many people, it is a surprise. Um, you know, I've been watching the news just like everyone else. And then also I've been in contact with our friends on the ground there. And they say, you know, they really were shocked. Um, there's always been saber rattling that has gone on um, from Russia um, with limited military action. And I think for the most part, we all really hoped and thought that this would just be another one of those kinds of episodes. But in fact, as we see before our eyes, you know, on our TV screens, it has become a reality. So uh, people there, are they, are they thinking that they should stay home, that they should flee? Uh, what are people, what are people thinking there now, right now? Well, um, as I'm sure you know, um, men are not allowed to leave the country. So there's no option to flee for them. They need every single man between age 18 and 60 to stay and defend their homeland. Um, a lot of people are leaving the country. However, what a lot of people don't know, Frank, is that not all Ukrainian citizens are even allowed to leave the country. Um, only just over half, it's estimated, have a biometric passport, which is the kind of passport that allows you to leave Ukraine. And so um, for many people, leaving is not an option. All they can do is go as far west as possible. So you were just on Fox uh, News Business and uh, did an interview 
And I would like you to tell us about that because you told a story about them sending Russians sending buses to offer people the opportunity to leave. Could you talk about that? Sure. So the the account that we received actually came to us from some friends that we have there. And so um, they've been staying in contact and, and updating us throughout, you know, the last weeks, um, almost daily, you know, just with reports of what's going on there in the Donbass region, which is the region of Ukraine where uh, the war has been raging since 2014, off and on. And um, this is in the city of Donetsk, which has had maybe... Donetsk and Lugansk are the two cities that have had more action than any other place. So last week we received um, notification that the Russian military went door to door announcing that they were offering safe passage to residents uh, to uh, escape what was coming. And they brought in big like Greyhound bus type buses, and they were allowed, I believe, to take two suitcases each and told that they would be given the equivalent of $129 if they took the military up on this opportunity. A lot of people went. A lot of people didn't go. Our friends did not accept this offer, and they chose to stay home. Uh, about a day or so later, their neighbors, who did accept the opportunity, contacted them to say that they had been on a bus for 22 hours, not given any food or water, not given any of the money that they had been promised, and that they had just been told that they were going to be sent to a spa in Siberia. But also, Frank, I think it's important to understand that just after that happened, the men who did not accept the offer for safe passage to Russia were rounded up about 24 hours later and, and conscripted into um, the separatist army. So they were taken against their will early in the morning from their homes and made to fight uh, for the enemy. Wow. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the separatist army, if you know anything about that? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. You know, I'm, I'm an American who's watching just like everyone else. And all I know is, you know, what I've seen, like, like many of us, I understand that there, the separatist army is considered to be, um, made up uh, depending on who you talk to, made up of uh, either Russians who've been brought in or perhaps even Ukrainians in the easternmost part of Ukraine who are loyal to the Russian government and to that military. So um, they are fighting against Ukraine. So what it means is that men were taken from their homes and made to fight for the enemy military. Wow, that's that's got to be hard. Um, have you been receiving any contact from anybody in the Ukraine since this started? All day long, every day. <laughs> uh, yeah, all day long, every day. So, in fact, I've been in contact with two missionaries who uh, – chose not to leave, two American missionaries who chose not to leave, but have stayed in place. They Both of them are serving alone in their cities. Both of them are single women, and um, they're working throughout the day, throughout the night, providing shelter, food, comfort to refugees who are streaming into their cities. And so... Um, we, you know, we keep saying we don't have any American boots on the ground, but in fact, we do. They're not military boots. Um, they're missionary boots and they're working and they're making a difference and they're touching people's lives. <laughs> Additionally, I've been in contact with several, several pastors 
and um, their church basements are full of um, internally di displaced people, you know, refugees who are coming in seeking shelter. Um, people want to huddle together. Of course, you know, you, you, you seek comfort from other people who are like-minded and who are in the same situation that you're in. So uh, I know we've all seen video of people hovering together in the subway stations, but they're also uh, gathering together in church basements. And these churches are attempting to feed these people, to house them, uh, to provide spiritual guidance to them. And so the church is alive and well and at work in Ukraine right now. So, Amy, could you talk about um, how strong is the church in Ukraine and how strong are the Christians like compared to us here? Um, evangelical Christians make up a small percentage of those who consider themselves to be Christians in Ukraine. Um, I believe that. Baptists in particular um, only make up about 2% of those who consider themselves to be Christians. Um, and uh, there are seminaries scattered throughout. Uh, I work with, with most of the seminaries in Ukraine. We have another ministry called Global Christian Scholarships in which anyone anywhere in the world can go online and apply for a scholarship if they feel they are called to a life of Christian ministry. And so I work very closely with several different seminaries there, and they are educating um young people and lay people to go out into their nation and um, to proclaim the name of Christ and uh, to be the next generation of church leadership. So what are some of the things that y'all, uh, y'all do over there? Could you give somebody a picture of this? I mean, uh, cause I know that you've taken thousands of people over to the Ukraine, but just, can you give us just a little glimpse of that? Sure, absolutely. So one of the things that we do um, that is been really, really successful and effective is that we have conversational English courses and it's not a bait and switch. We don't offer an English school and turn it into Sunday school. We uh, do our very best to provide a high quality conversational English course on six different levels of English. And we do our best to deliver what we advertise and, and what we promise. Um, but in so doing, we earn the opportunity uh, to give them not only what they want, which is the English language, which will open a lot of doors for them for a brighter future, but also to share what they need, which is an understanding um, that God loves them, has a plan and purpose for their lives, and um, he cares so much for, for them and thinks that they're so important that he sent his son, Jesus, so that they could have a relationship with him through his son. That's outstanding. So, Amy, I know that we're going to be in prayer for your ministry because I'm assuming things are going to come to a grinding halt uh, right now as this war goes on. Um, I can't even imagine, you know, what day-to-day -day life will be like. We're talking about the ultimate disruption. My question is, what is your message to to Christians here? What can we do? There's a lot of people watching this show and, and we just want to know what to do. So tell us what to do. So of course, pray, <laughs> definitely pray, yes. you know, um, and support, support other Christians and just the nation of Ukraine and pray for peace and um, don't underestimate um, the spirit of the Ukrainian people. You know, the first line of the Ukrainian national anthem is Ukraine is not yet dead, nor is glory and freedom 
and they are prepared to fight and defend their homeland. So pray for them and support them in that. And then I would say to follow uh, the guidelines that President Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, put out. Um, make a call to lawmakers. Um, call your congressman, call your senator, and ask them to provide support to to Ukraine. Um, also, Frank, I would just say too, though, that during the pandemic, um, MGI has pivoted a little bit and we've gone online. And during the pandemic, we have had over 6,000 online students participating in our English courses um, through an online platform. And uh, we have, we just completed a school where we had 1,400 more students sign up uh, for our classes. And then we had another school that was set to start um, in mid-March. We will see, you know, we'll see where we stand with that. Um, but we will continue our work in Ukraine um, by whatever means necessary and whatever means we can find to be involved there in continuing our work. That is outstanding. Well, as we wrap up this interview, um, I want our listeners to know how we can keep up with you and uh, any websites. Uh, how can we? track what you're doing? So um, you can go to Michael Gott, uh, sorry, MGI.global um, or Michael Gott International um, on all of the uh, social media platforms. And uh, we keep things updated and keep people informed as to exactly what we are doing, of course, on those platforms. And um, we welcome your involvement and your prayer support as well. Um, I know that there are people who follow you and your podcast, Frank, who are some of our mission volunteers who go out with us pretty mm -hmm. regularly. And uh, so our teams are made up of, of people from all over the U.S., um, who want to make a real difference and uh, be involved in something on the front lines of ministry. And um, this definitely is. And so um, we welcome you to check us out, contact us and get involved. I urge everybody to do that, particularly, you know, as we watch this war unfold, um, there's inevitably going to be some changes, things that are different. And, you know, I know that, uh, you know, MGI is going to be there to help rebuild. And so, you know, we look forward to partnering with you on, you know, what the Institute for Christian Defense can do. We're going to walk beside you and, and be right there. Thank you so much uh, for taking time today. Uh, we had to get you on before you get your own show on Fox because you did so good <laughs> on there. But uh, you're a, a blessing and also uh, your your husband and, and your, your two beautiful children. Uh, tell them we uh, all said hello. Well, God bless you. Thank you for listening. Uh, and remember, you can find us at defendingthefaith.law. You can find out more about what we're doing to make a difference around the world concerning religious liberty. Pray for Ukraine. We will see you in the next episode.